Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. This will be a little different than what was originally planned. Because originally we were going to look at the entirety of Luke 16. Once I got into it, got involved in preparing for it, I realized that parable of dishonest manager, also known as the unjust steward, was going to take longer than I initially thought. So we will not get to the story of Lazarus and the rich man tonight. So chapter 16 is going to be broken up into two weeks. So if you have your Bible, open it up to Luke 16. If you don't have your Bible, go get it because this is a Bible study. And I have no idea where that noise is coming from. Oh, yes I do. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So tonight, I'll assume you have your Bibles by now. We will have a word of prayer and we will get started. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this opportunity to open your word and share it. God, I pray that you would give me the words to speak that others might understand that what I say would be correct, would be edifying to those who are listening, would glorify you. And God, I pray that you'd be with each and every person who's watching this and that you would open their ears, that you would give them ears to hear, that they might understand your word, that they might grow closer to you and be more knowledgeable about your word. God, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we are on Luke 16 as we continue our travels through the books of Theophilus. Uh, Luke's letter to the his Greek friend, Theophilus, about the life of Jesus and the church. Now, got to back up just a little bit. Jesus has been speaking to a group of his disciples and the Pharisees and scribes. He just finished telling them the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, also known as the prodigal son. He continues on in his teaching with the story of the dishonest steward. So we have to remember, who's he talking to? He's talking to disciples, Pharisees, and scribes. And he says, in verse 1, He also said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Now, what's a steward? Steward is the guy who manages the estate. He takes care of his boss's money, other people that work for the boss. He's kind of the head guy. He bought and sold stuff for the owner. He's basically the owner's right-hand man. Now, what's the history of stewards? Well, let's go back to Genesis. Genesis 39. Let's put a marker here so I don't lose my page. Probably the most famous steward in the Bible. More has been said about this steward than any other person, any other steward. 
Genesis 39, starting at verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master in Egypt. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had and made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Joseph was a steward. Joseph was in charge of everything in Potiphar's house. He, Joseph, managed everything. Potiphar didn't worry about anything. The only thing Potiphar knew was that he got fed every day and that Joseph was taking care of everything else. That's what a steward did. But, going back to Luke 16, Somebody came to the rich man and told him that his steward was ripping him off. He was being dishonest. He was wasting his goods. Now, this comes right after the prodigal son. And just like the prodigal son, this steward was wasting the resources that were available to him. But, Unlike the prodigal son, he was sensible enough to make sure that he wasn't left friendless. Remember, the prodigal son wasted all his money and had nothing, and once the money was gone, there was nobody there to help him. His friends all disappeared. Well, this steward was smart enough to make sure that didn't happen. So, The rich man told him, give an account of your stewardship, bring me the books, for you can no longer be steward. Now, this was a mistake. And I say that because by telling the steward he was going to be fired, he gave the steward an opportunity to rip him off even more. But the rich man was not smart enough or didn't realize that his steward wasn't incompetent. He was just a fraud. If he had thought about it, he would have thought, okay, I'm going to have him bring me the books and then I'm going to fire him. But by telling him he was going to fire him ahead of time, it gave the steward the opportunity to defraud him even more. Verse 3. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master has taken the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I've resolved what to do that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their homes. So, he's saying, I'm not fit for physical labor. You know, and I'm too proud to beg. So he thought, he resolved what to do. He would continue his dishonesty <coughs> by cooking the books. Those who owed his master money, he would cut down how much they owed so that 
they would be friendly to him, that they would be indebted to him, and they would take care of him. Verse 5. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. Now, we have to stop right here. Basically in the middle of the paragraph. This guy was a steward. He knew, because he kept the books, exactly how much each of these people owed his master. But yet, he asked them, how much do you owe? And they answered, and he said, okay, scratch that out, put down less amount. This way, they knew what a deal he was giving them. Now, there's a possibility, and we don't know because Jesus doesn't say, but there's a possibility that because of the fact that Jews could not charge interest to other Jews, you know, God had forbid it, that these numbers might have been fudged to start with. You know, these guys may have, you know, owed 80 gotten 80 measures of oil but they were billed for a hundred and that would be a way that they could charge interest without charging interest in their minds we don't know that just possibility so he writes he writes down all these bills marks them down rips his master off and in verse 8 so the master can obviously the master found out about it and the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. So basically, the master com commended him for his fraud. The master obviously found out about it and realized that his steward had outwitted him and the master recognized his criminal genius. He recognized that his steward had changed the bills in order to benefit himself. It's kind of like small time criminals Small-time criminals admire big-time criminals because of their genius and what they, what they do, what they get away with. So what does that tell us about the master? The master is immoral and as much a criminal as the steward was. But then Jesus says, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than sons of light. Criminals, not criminals, the lost, know much more about finagling in the world than the sons of light or Christians. Obviously they weren't they weren't Christians at that point because Jesus hadn't been to the cross yet. But those who were seeking after righteousness were much more honest than those who were not. Moving on.
For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Well, now that doesn't make sense, does it? It does to the Christian. Jesus is not saying to make friends with money. What he is saying is that we're to use money in a way that will accrue friends, to make friends for eternity by investing in the gospel that brings sinners to salvation so that one day when we die and go to our eternal home, our friends will be there to meet us. Those sinners that we reach with the gospel will be there to welcome us when we arrive in heaven. Now, Jesus is not commending this man's dishonesty, which would be very easy to read that that's what he's doing. He's using him as an illustration to show that even the most wicked are shrewd enough to provide for themselves against what's coming. Believers should be even more shrewd because we're concerned with eternal matters, not just earthly ones. And he continues in verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust, unjust, not unjust. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? He that is faithful. Faithful use of your earthly wealth. No matter how much you have or how little you have. Is repeatedly tied to the accumulation of treasures in heaven. We're told not to put our treasures in a bag where moths and rust destroy it. But treasures in heaven. And he says, if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? another man's. He's referring to God and the believer's stewardship of his money, which believers only manage as stewards for God. What you have has been given to you by God. And your responsibility to him is to use it wisely for his kingdom. It does you no good to store it all away for a rainy day, which you have a responsibility to plan ahead, but putting everything away rather than using a portion of it 
for God's work is wrong. You have to trust that God will take care of you. No matter what happens. God is sovereign. God is watching over his universe. He is controlling everything that happens. And you just have to have faith that what is coming is part of God's plan and that he's going to take care of you. And then he says, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Famous verse. You can't serve God and mammon. Well, we all know mammon is money. And money was a huge factor for Pharisees. The Pharisees were supposedly the most righteous of the righteous. And yet they were so focused on money. If you remember, twice Jesus went into the temple and ran out the money changers and the people who were selling things. Because the Pharisees allowed them to do that because the Pharisees got a cut. You'd go to the temple, used to be you had to bring your best as a sacrifice. You know, the animals that you were going to sacrifice had to be perfect. And the Pharisees started letting people bring in non-perfect animals. And it was sort of like, well, that's not perfect, but, you know, you can bring it in, you know, just make sure you throw an extra few coins in the coffer. You were allowed to, if you came from a long distance, you were allowed to, once you got to Jerusalem, buy an animal for your sacrifice. Well, that's fine, except you had to use the temple coins to buy your animals. So you had money changers. Money changers would take your drachmas or whatever, and they would convert it into the temple money. And of course, they skimmed a little off the top, you know, as a fee for money changing. And then you would take that money and you would buy the animal you were going to sacrifice. So the guy there selling the animals, he was making money and he was paying a portion of that money to the Pharisees. So the Pharisees were making money when you walked in the door, when you bought your sacrifice animal, and they were just all about the money. And Jesus says, you cannot serve God and mammon. Pretty straightforward. You who are supposedly the righteous of the righteous, your God is the money. And in verse 14, he says, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. Now, one of the things to think about in this, in this parable is, who is Jesus talking about? Let me slide this paper out of the way. Yeah, 
in this parable, God is the master, and the Pharisees are the stewards. They subverted the law to make themselves rich through their actions. And Jesus says, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. Now, this is right after the Pharisees heard all these things and they derided him. So he responds to them and says, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of the Lord, in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. And it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. So, Jesus is saying that the law and the prophets were in charge up until John. John preached the gospel of the kingdom. And everyone was pressing into it. While the Pharisees were busy opposing Christ, sinners were entering the kingdom in droves. But, he also said, and everyone is pressing into it. In the original language, the pressing into it is almost a violent struggle. Like they were trying to, they were bashing down the doors of heaven to get in. Not literally, but that's kind of, you know, what Jesus is saying. And he said, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. <clears throat> Excuse me. We should know what a tittle is. Jot and tittle are markings in Jewish writing, in Hebrew. Little marks over some of the letters and it make them mean different things. And Jesus is saying that the moral principles of the law, the eternal truth contained in the law's types and symbols, because the law all points to Jesus, and that the promises recorded by all of the prophets all remain in force. Just because Jesus came and the kingdom message is preached doesn't mean that the law and the prophets are done away with. The law and the prophets are just as fundamental, important, I'm not even sure what the right word is, today as they were 2,000 years ago. They have nothing to do with salvation. The law and the prophets merely showed man how he was to live. And they point towards the coming of Christ. Some of the laws for Gentiles because you have to remember, the laws and the prophets were given to the Hebrews. For Gentiles, some of the laws have changed. In fact, for Jews who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, some of the laws don't apply anymore. It's okay to eat bacon. If you're a Christian, bacon's fine. If you're not a Christian, if you're 
a Jew, if you have rejected Jesus as the Messiah, then you're still under the law. And all the law, all 613 or 31, whichever it is, you're responsible for, each and every one of them. But you got to remember, Jesus was talking to Hebrews. And he says, not one tittle of the law shall pass away. Then, and Luke just throws us in there. He finishes talking about that, about the steward. And he says, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. That's it. That's Jesus' entire words on divorce. It's questionable, in my mind anyhow, why Luke included that, but included so little about it. And I think that the reason he did is because that was a big problem among the Pharisees and among Jews in entirely. So let's go back to Genesis? No, not Genesis. Matthew. <laughs> I don't think Jesus is going to say anything in Genesis about divorce. So let's go back to Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32. This is the first time Jesus addresses divorce. And let's start back in 27, because it relates. <clears throat> Matthew 5, starting at verse 27 through 32. You have heard that, it, no, this is from Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Now, those of old. Let's go back and look at that. And I need to put my cheaters on. Um, 27. Exodus 20, verse 14. I'll jump there. You don't have to because we're just going to be there for a second. Exodus 20, verse 14. the laws and 20 not 21 don't you hate it when you do that you go to the wrong chapter 10 commandments you shall not commit adultery that's pretty straightforward so what else does he say Let's go to Deuteronomy 5.18. And in 5.18, it says, this is a repeating of the Ten Commandments to those um, Jews who have gone through the 40 years. Moses is reiterating to them, you shall not commit adultery. So when Jesus says, you have heard it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery, this is what he's talking about. You know, it's in the Ten Commandments. It's pretty basic. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. 
For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you than one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Carrying on. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Okay? We got that? Then let's go back to Matthew. Um, what was it? Matthew 5, 31 and 32. Almost there. And he says, Furthermore, it's been said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason, I just read that, didn't I? <laughs> so, sorry about that. Jump over to Matthew 19. And that would be Matthew 19, starting at verse 1. Now it came to pass, when Jesus finished these sayings, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? <coughs> They're testing him. Because the scribes, you know, the all-knowing rabbis, the lawyers, say that you can divorce, divorce your wife for any reason. Moses said, if you divorce her for any reason other than sexual immorality, you cause her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries her commits adultery. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And they said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. <coughs> Luke, in his short one verse, just covers the basics. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. We don't know if there was more to that when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees there. But we do know that Jesus has covered the subject previously. So, we don't have to worry about it. Jesus is just saying in this one verse that 
the rabbi's doctrine, which permitted, permitted men to divorce their wives easily and for almost any cause, was wrong. Probably one of the best ways I've ever heard it. And I don't know if it's... If it's an actual verse in the Bible, I don't think it is. I think it's just something that man has said. But it is that divorce other than for sexual immorality, is an abomination to God. Now, does divorce happen? Yeah. It happens, if you believe statistics, it happens as much among Christians as it does in the world. You know, non-Christians and Christians supposedly have pretty much equal divorce rates. This shouldn't be, but we are dealing with sinful creatures. There are people who... as unregenerate sinners, as non-Christians who get divorced. And they remarry. Therefore, according to God's word, they are sinning. They are committing adultery. But, and this is a big but, If you have divorced, husband or wife, either one, doesn't matter, and remarried, and then became a Christian, you got nothing to worry about. Because Christ took away that sin. This is a subject that we could talk about for on and on and on. What we do know is that Jesus Christ born of a virgin, lived a perfect, sinless life, went to the cross, took the sins of his people upon himself, suffered the wrath of God, died, was stuck in a tomb, three days later rose from the dead, and ascended to be with his father. Jesus took the sins of every one of his people, those whom God elected before the founding of the world, those whom God wrote his, their names in the Lamb's Book of Life. And one day, those people will be with him in heaven. So the question is, is Christ your Lord and Savior? Have you repented of your sins? Has God given you the faith necessary for your salvation? If he has, fantastic. Someday we'll be in heaven together. 
if he hasn't, then you need to take a look at your life. You need to understand what awaits you if you don't repent and be saved. Next week, we're going to look at the story. And I say story because I don't believe it's a parable. The story of the rich man and Lazarus. And a little bit about Hades and Gehenna and heaven and Abraham's bosom. And we might even bring in some non-biblical information to show what the Jewish people believed at the time of Christ. So, have a wonderful week. I will see you here. Well, I won't see you. You'll see me here next week, next Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Don't forget, at 10.30 on Sunday morning, we will be Facebook living our full service. So if you're not able to join us, we'd love to have you with us there in spirit on Facebook. If you'd like to join us, shoot us a message here on Facebook and we can get you directions on how to get there. Um, we're still praying that God will give us a, a building to be able to meet something a little bit larger than where we are now. But shoot us a message and we'll get you directions. Sunday school, 9.30, Sunday morning. We are still working our way through the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. And then 10.30 worship service. And I hope we will see you there or you'll see us here on Facebook. Okay? Have a great week. Go serve your king.